Good afternoon. Welcome back to Codex. This summer, many, but not all, of the students, excuse me, many, but not all of our talks feature graduate students and postdocs who were nominated to speak by their senior colleagues. Today, we're very happy to have the next speaker in this series, Davi Castro Silva. Davi is currently working on his PhD at the University of Cologne with Professor Frank Valentin. He expects to graduate in December of this year with a thesis covering various topics in combinatorial optimization. We're very happy to have him here today to tell us about geometrical sets with forbidden configurations. Take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, John, for the introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me to talk here. And this talk is going to be mainly about a recent paper of mine, which is available in preprints form here on archive. And it has the same title as the talk. And well, the general problem that I'm going to consider in this talk is the following. How large can a set be if it does not contain a given geometrical configuration? So for instance, in the simplest case, when the configuration consists of only two points on RT, then up to congruence, it's characterized by the distance between the points. And then the question becomes, what's the maximum density that a subset of RT can have if it does not contain pairs of points at distance one? And note that the problem is dilation invariant. So it doesn't really make a difference if we restrict the the distance should be one or any other number. And we call it like this MRT of one. So for example, here is a set on the plane that avoids distance one. And it's a periodic set, which is formed by disks, open disks of radius one half. And they are centered on the, on the vertices of an equilateral lattice of side length two. And then you can see that there are no two points in the sets that have distance one. First, because inside each, each disk, it's an open disk of radius one half, so it doesn't have inside each disk. And they are also far apart from each other, so there will be no between two disks of them. And in order to compute the density, for this set, it's very easy because this is a periodic set. So you can actually just take this triangle here that I outlined, and then the set will be just a translation rotation of this same triangle. And here, the, uh, the density of the set can be computed as follows. So this has exactly one half of the disk of radius one half. And so the area of the balls inside this triangle is pi over eight. And the total, uh, the total area of this triangle is root three. So the density of this set is exactly equal to the density inside this triangle which is pi over eight root three. And this shows that the, the independence, that this maximum density of a set avoiding distance one is at least equal to this, which is about 0 0.226. And it's an old conjecture of Erdős from 1982 that this extremal density on the plane is less than one fourth which means that any measurable set that covers one fourth of the Euclidean plane will necessarily have two points at unit distance. And despite a lot of study on this, the conjecture is still open. But we have some good bounds. So here first about uh, the lower bound of 0 0.229 uh, was given by Croft in 67. And it's essentially a tweaking of this of the set here, where instead of packing disks, he packs uh, tortoises, which are a disk with the union of an hexagon. Uh, is there a question? Sorry. And, no. Okay. And there's also this upper bound here. Well, this is the best known upper bound for now. So this is due to Ambrose and Matoxi from last year. Of Well, it almost gets to the uh, to set the near conjecture. So it gets up to 0 0.254. And this was done using methods from Fourier analysis and linear programming. So it's actually quite non-trivial, this bound. And for higher dimensions, there's a famous theorem of Franklin and Wilson that says that that implies that this extremal density decays exponentially with the dimension. That is, and it obtains this bound here. So uh, the extremal density of a set that does not contain 
two points at distance one is at most 1.2 to the power of minus the dimension. This has been already uh, improved, but not too much. We still don't know if it's uh, less than 1.3 to the power of minus the dimension. And this is essentially what we can say about this problem. But now, what if we forbid several different distances, say R1, R1 up to Rn? Then we denote like this MRT of R1 up to Rn as the maximum density of a set in RT, which avoids all of these distances. And now this quantity will depend not only on the number of forbidden distances and the dimension of the space, but also on how these distances relate to each other. So it's a much more complex question. Oh, sorry, can I ask a question here? Yes, of course. Yeah, so for the Frankel Wilson theorem, so if we use the uh, lattice packing idea in the previous slide, what does it give as a lower bound? Well, for this specific case, this is only for R2, but it gives about 0 0.226. Yeah, but we can uh, do the same thing for RD as well. We have some good yes. lattice. Yeah, it also gives an exponential, uh, now it gets a lower bound. It's an exponential lower bound. The Franco Wilson theorem is an exponential upper bound. But I they think, don't, but it's exponentially I, worse. The, the base yes, is different. It is worse. I okay. don't know exactly which, uh, what it gives really. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. And then this parameter was first studied by Zekeli in 1983. But then conjecture that if this sequence of forbidden distances is not bounded from above, then the extremal distance of a set that avoids all of these distances is equal to zero. And this conjecture was later proven by Furstenberg, Katz, Nelson, Weiss using ergodic theory, which showed the following result. So if a set A on the plane has positive density, then there is some number L0 such that for any L greater than L0, one can find a pair of points on this set with distance L. In other words, sets of positive density realize all sufficiently large distances. And then this theorem was later generalized by Burgan using Fourier analysis from two point configurations in R2 to D point configurations in RT. And then, well, I should just first remark here that these dates here are dates of publication. They are slightly misleading since this theorem really came before Brugan's results. Okay, so Brugan showed, let P be a set of D points on RT, which span a D minus one dimensional hyperplane. So they are non-degenerate in some sense. Then if A is a set of positive upper density, then there is some number L zero such that A contains a concurrent copy of L times P for L, all L bigger than L zero. So it contains congruent copies of all sufficiently large dilates of this configuration. And this serves to motivate the notion of independence density. So given finite configurations P1 up to Pn, we denote like this MRT of P1 up to Pn as the maximum density of a set on RT, which uh, do not contain congruent copies of any of the Pi. And this uh, notes that this generalizes the earlier notion of extremal density for forbidden, uh, forbidden distances to higher order configurations. Because you can think of a uh, forbidden distance as a forbidden configuration of two points which span that distance. So in particular here, in this notation, the independence density of these two point configurations, one the origin and the other the first uh, basis vector, this is exactly equal to what we called before this notion of MRT of one. And so this is really a generalization of the earlier result, of the earlier notion. This can also be seen as the natural analog of the independence number of the geometric hypergraph, which holds copies of these forbidden configurations in RT. What I mean by this is the following. So if we consider the infinite geometrical hypergraph, where the vertex set is all points on RT, and then a set of points form an edge, if they are congruent to one of the forbidden configurations, then the independence density of the assembly of configurations is exactly equal to the uh, density of the maximum in the, of a maximum independent set on this hypergraph. And Brugan's theorem in this notation can be written as follows. 
So if LJ is a sequence of dilation parameters that's not bounded from above, then the independent sequence of the corresponding dilates of configuration P is equal to zero, if the configuration P satisfies the hypothesis, which is uh, they have B points and are affinely independent. And our goal here in this talk is to study this independence density and some related geometrical parameters. So for instance, in order to drive our analysis, we consider the following questions. The first one, well, first we see that actually Brugan's theorem implies that this quantity here, the independence density of any distinct dilates of some configuration P, it goes to zero with N if these dilation parameters grow larger and larger. And so the first question that we ask is what's exactly the rate of decay of this, of this quantity with the number of forbidden dilates as the ratios between the consecutive scales get large. The second question is what possible values can be taken by independence density of any distinct dilates of a configuration P? And then a third question, are there analogous results which are valid for other non-Euclidean spaces? And for the purpose of this talk, we'll concentrate on the sphere. Okay, well, now let's settle some notation. So first, for some x in Rt and some number r bigger than zero, we denote like this qxr. It's the axis parallel q of side length r and center x, which means we just take the usual cube center on the origin and with side length r and translate it by x. And if we have a measurable set A, then we denote like this dqxr of A. It's just the density of this set A inside the cube qxr, which is then the volume of the intersection divided by the volume of the cube. And we need to define also the notion of upper density of a measurable set, which is denoted like this, the upper line of the set A, which is just the limb soup of the density of A inside cubes centered on the origin with larger and larger uh, side lengths. And the reason that we have to consider this is because not all measurable sets on RT will have a well-defined density, but they always have a well-defined upper density, and this is enough for us. If this limit exists, then we denote it by dA and say that it's the density. And a configuration for us, which will usually be denoted by P, is a finite subset of RT. And we say that it is admissible if it has at most D points, where D is the dimension of the space, and if it's non-degenerate in the sense that it spans a maximal dimension of a fine hyperplane. And note that those are essentially the conditions from Brugan's theorem that we saw in the introduction. And the reason that we need them is also the same reason as Brugan needed, because we use many of the same methods. Okay. Two configurations, P and Q, they are said to be concurrent if they can be made equal using radio transformation. So for instance, these three configurations here that are true, they are congruent because they can be uh, made equal by using only translation, rotation, or reflection. So this is just the usual notion of, conversion, of congruence. And then we say that a set A avoids P if no subset of A is congruent to P. Now with this, we can finally formally define the notion of independence density. So if we are given n configurations p1 of 2pn, there are two notions that we define. The first one is on the whole of the space RT. So as in the introduction, we call MRT of p1 of 2pn. And this is the supremum of the upper density of A over all sets A on RT, which avoids these configurations p1 of 2pn. And we also consider a local notion of independence density on cubes which we call mq0r for a cube of a side length r of p1 of 2pn, which is just the density of a set A inside this cube, where A is a subset of the, of the cube that avoids all of these configurations. Okay. And then, well, first, let's show some easy bounds. For all finite configurations p on the space RT, then the independence density of the configuration P is at least one over four to the D, and it's at most one minus one over P, 
over the cardinality of p. And this, these bounds are very easy. The first one is proven by a sphere packing argument, and the second one by a, an averaging argument. And they are terrible, of course, but the only thing that matters for us here is that uh, the independence density is bounded away both from zero and from one. This is important. And we can also relate the two notions of independence density that I defined. So here, we, I write diameter of P for the maximum distance between two of the points of in P. And so we have this bound here, which are also easy to prove, but the only thing that really matters for us is that the, the local notion of independence density on cubes converges to the global notion of the independence density of the same configuration on RT if the site length of the cube gets larger and larger. And this is geometrically intuitive, but it's also true. <laughs> it's also an important thing. And this explains why we need the second notion of uh, independence density, because it's much easier to work on the cube, which is a compact space, than on RT. And then we can prove results for the cube and transfer them to RD by using this, the simple inequalities. Any questions so far? So what if we use other tilings other than cubes? Is it any better? Uh, well, it doesn't really matter. I think the uh, for the M of RG, the entire independence density on the Euclidean space, I don't think it matters as long as it's convex and has open interior, has non-empty interior. But yeah. For this, yeah, it would just be harder to prove something like this, but I don't think it really matters. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. And now, since we are considering sets with avoid some configuration P, then it's also important to have a way of counting how many configurations there are in a set. And this is what this counting function IP does. So given some configuration P on the space, we denote by IP the function that counts how many congruent copies of P are contained in a set A, which is what I wrote here, which is essentially just an integral over all configurations Q which are congruent to P of the indicator function of whether Q is contained in A or not. But this is just the idea. The, the formal definition is the following. So if we have this configuration of k points p1 up to vk and the set a, then this counting function evaluated at a is given by the double integral, where a here uh, represents the indicator function of the set with the same name, and mu is the uniform or higher probability measure on the orthogonal group. Just note that this, since a is an indicator function, this product here is going to be one if all of these points are contained in A and zero otherwise. So this is actually just a formalization of the earlier, of this equation here. That's not well defined. And just a couple of quick remarks. The first one is that if R, the side length of the cube is very large, then this counting function IP of a cube of length R is about up to lower order terms, r to the t. So anytime we have a set that's contained in a, in a cube of side length r, we should compare it with r to the t, the, uh, the counting function we should compare with r to the t. And also we can similarly define the weighted version ip of f for some function f from rt to r, where this integral makes sense. So don't really need to worry about these conversions issues. Uh, a function f in LK, for instance, is going to work. And here we just replace each occurrence of A by F. And what this means is that it's counting copies of P weighted by this function F. And well, most of the analysis is actually carried out by trying to get a better grasp of this counting function IP. Well, first of all, we want some kind of robustness for the counting function. So given some delta bigger than zero, we denote by Q delta the 
normalized indicator function of the set of the cube centered on the origin with side length delta. So it's just delta to the minus t times the indicator function of this cube. And then if you take the, uh, the convolution product with the indicator function of a set A, after some computation, this gives just the local density of A at this point considered. And this is more easily seen with a picture. So I think of it as a blurring operation. So here on the left, I drew a, a set, a planar set on the unit square. And on the right, there is this blurred set, which is uh, the indicator function of A convoluted with Q delta for some small delta. And this is not a set, but it's a function. And here, at each point here, the value of this function is given by the shade of gray according to this scale. And so this is essentially a blurring of the sets. And what we want to know is whether if we are computing the, the counting function of some configuration here and the same configuration here weighted by the, the blurred set, if these two counts are going to be similar if the parameter delta is small. And the first main tool that we need for, the, for most of the results is a counting lemma, which has this mode to blurring assets does not significantly change the count of admissible configurations. And so, well, more formally, for every admissible configuration P, there exists some constant CP, so that for every measurable set inside a cube of set length R, the difference between the count of copies of the configuration P inside A and the same, the count of copies of this configuration weighted by this blurred set is going to zero when delta goes to zero. And see that here we have this normalizing, uh, normalizing factor r to the t, which is what we would expect if it were a very dense set on the cube. An important point here is that the bound is uniform over all measurable sets inside the cube. It would be easier to obtain a similar result, but without having this uniform bound, and this wouldn't be enough for us. And as you can imagine, just by seeing the convolution products, the method of proof is fully analytic in nature. And it draws from the arguments of Burgan that he used in order to prove his lemma that I showed in the, his theorem in, that I showed in the introduction. And, and I won't have time to get into this here, but I want to say just that this is similar in spirit to counting lemmas in graph and hypergraph theory. So the second main tool that we need. Sorry, uh, just one. Uh, yes. What do you mean by similar to the hypergraph? I mean, over there, how do you define the convolution and things like that for the discrete? Yeah, no, the convolution is just because this convolution is an averaging over cubes. And also, we, we are counting how many copies of PDR are in A and how many copies of PDR are in uh, an average version of A. And we are saying that they are uh, very close together. And the same thing is true in graph theory, if you are counting copies of some graph P, of some small graph inside a large graph, and inside a graph which is an average version of the graph, which is the- Some, the some average? Huh? It's average what? over, yeah, the edge density, replace the edges by the edge density between the classes of, of vertices, which are regular. You know? I see, I see, thanks. Yeah. That sounds interesting. Okay. Yeah, and then the second main tool that we need, well, is the supersaturation theorem, which also has a motto. It says that if a set is slightly denser than the independence density of P, then it must contain a positive proportion of all copies of P. And this happens if P is such a useful. And so here, so for every admissible P, if a set A inside that very large cube has density which is larger than the independence density of P inside this cube plus some small value epsilon, then by definition, it must contain a copy of P. But what this theorem says is that it doesn't only contain one or two copies of P, but a positive proportion of them all. So the counting function of P evaluated at A gives a positive constant C times R to the T, which is the usual normalizing factor when we are considering these cubes. And this is proving 
proven using weak star continuity of the counting function IP and the Lebesgue density theorem. And also this weak star continuity of the counting function follows from the counting lemma. You have to work a little, but the main part of the proof is the counting lemma. And so this is why we need the uh, configuration P to be admissible. And this is very similar to supersaturation results in graph and hypergraph theory. Okay, those are the two main those that we need in order to prove the results, but now let me show you some, some of these results on the independence density. Uh, the first one was actually already proven by book in 2008, but I think it's very instructive, so I'll try to give the proof here. So it says that for any configurations P1 up to Pn in RD, we have that their joint independence density is at least equal to the products of their independence densities taken separately. That is, the independence density parameter is super multiplicative. And well, I'll try, <laughs> I'll have to go a bit quicker here, but the proof, you first take an epsilon bigger than zero and some large parameter r, which is going to be the, the side length of a cube, and it's sufficiently large compared to epsilon. And then for each i from one to n, we take a an almost optimal PI avoiding set AI, and almost optimal in the sense that its upper density is at least equal to the upper density of the configuration PI minus some epsilon. And then since we have an epsilon of room, we can assume that each AI is periodic with the same periods R. And this is proven by a counting, by a tiling argument that's explained in this picture. I don't think I'm going to have a lot of time to, <laughs> to give you the idea, but essentially you just take a cube where this set AI is dense, and then you tessellate the space using the intersection of AI with this cube, but with some, some room here of diameter P between these cubes, because then you don't, uh, you don't give, you don't get a copy of P just by tessellating it. And so this set here, if you do everything right, it's going to have a density which is very close to the density of this, to the upper density of the set AI we started with, and it won't have any copy of PI. This is the idea, but I won't have much time to explain it. Well, now, for any fixed x1 up to xn in RG, this intersection set here, which is the sets AI in uh, translated by xi will each have uh, will avoid each one of the pi and this is easy to see by steps so first by translating some sets that avoids a configuration then you have a set that also avoids this configuration and then by intersecting them all you're going to avoid all of the configurations and now now it's a kind of probabilistic argument if the uh, translation parameters xi are chosen uniformly and independently at random over this cube q0r, just remind you that each AI is uh, supposed to be periodic, and this is a fundamental domain of, of each one of the AI. And if we choose these parameters AI in a uniform and independent way, then the density of this translated set will also be a, a a random variable which will have some independence. And with this independence, you can show that the expected density is equal to the products of the densities. This is a simple probabilistic argument that you can make around. And then because of this, there exists some x1 of checks n. So that's the density of this intersected set is at least equal to the expected density, which is the product of the of their densities, which is by construction at least the independence density of each pi, uh, the products of the independence density of each pi minus epsilon. And since this set here avoids each one of the pi's and epsilon is arbitrary, then we get the, the inequality we wanted to prove. This I just wanted to show because it also gives some indication of when 
the, uh, the inequalities and almost equality. Because intuitively, if the independence density of this their joint independence density of the several configurations is close to the products of three independence densities, then we can think of this as saying that the constraints of avoiding each one of the configurations PR, PI are uncorrelated or independent from each other. And then there's no better way, as we signed the proof, of choosing a set which avoids each one of the configurations than just intersecting optimal PI avoiding sets inside uh, for each I. And then if you think about this for a moment, you might expect this to happen if the natural sizes of HPI are very different from each other. Because then the constraints of avoiding each one of these configurations will be relevant at different scales, which are largely independent from each other. And the next theorem says that this is indeed true if the configurations are admissible. So if P1 up to Pn are admissible configurations, then by forbidding very, uh, very far apart dilates of each one of them, the independence density is going to untangle and tends to the product of the individual independence densities. This is essentially just the same of the idea I was trying to say here before, just a formalization. And I know that this is proven using in conjunction the counting lemma and the supersaturation theorem based on an argument of book. So first of all, book shows a similar result for forbidden distances. So for forbidden two point configurations. And then if we use the counting lemma and supersaturation theorem, then we can just apply his methods in order to prove this for general optimism configurations. Any questions? Okay, well, an immediate corollary of this is a partial answer to our question Q1 from the introduction. So if P is an admissible configuration, then the independence density of very distant dilates of P is going to tend to the power of uh, this independence density of P to the power of the number of dilates, which is essentially as fast as you can get by Book's theorem, it not only goes to zero, the independence density of several different dilates, but it goes to zero as fast as possible, given super multiplicativity. And from this, it's easy to deduce Brugan's theorem. Let's recall that it can be put in this form. So the independence density of a sequence of dilates of P is equal to zero for all unbounded positive sequences of dilation parameters. And this is easy to see here because here you get essentially uh, one exponential decay if the parameters are very large. But if the sequence is unbounded, you can take the a subsequence which goes very, very fast to infinity. And then you get that it compares to zero. Yes, a very interesting remark I find is that this result's not necessarily true if the configurations are not admissible. This is due to a result of Graham from 94. He proved that if P is non spherical, which means that if P is not contained in the surface of a sphere of finite radius, then there exists sets of positive density on RD, which avoids all of these dilates of P. So avoids each P dilated by the square roots of a not integer. And so these results here are false if they are not necessarily true if the configurations are not admissible. Just note that every admissible configuration can be put on the surface of a sphere because we assume it to be a finely independent. Other results that we can get by combining the counting lemma and the supersaturation theorem is that the independence density function is continuous on the set of admissible configurations. And even the multivariate version of the independence density function is continuous on the set of several admissible configurations. And with these results now, we can also give a partial answer to our question Q2 from the introduction, which uh, it asked us to characterize all possible independence densities when forbidding n distinct dilates of some configuration P. 
that is just to characterize the set here, mn of p that I define. And using the last results, I can show that if p is an atomistable configuration, then the closure of the set is going to be a disclosed interval here from the independence density of p to the power n to the independence density of p. And that, actually, I can show something more. I just don't know if the extremal points here belong to the set, but the open interval is contained on the set, which is in itself contains on the closed interval. And the proof now is quite simple because, uh, first of all, the independence density of several distant dilates of P is at most the independence density of a single dilate of P, which by dilation variance is equal to this uh, left extremity here, to this right extremity, sorry. And also by books result super multiplicativity, we have that the independence density of several different dilates is at least their product, which again by the relation variance, we get this left extremity here. But now both of these extremal points are going to be accumulation points of the set. The, the left one here, because uh, when the dilation parameters are very far apart from each other, and this is what the, the corollary I just showed said, and the right one here, when they are very close together. And this happens because of continuity. And then we get essentially the whole interval between them just by continuity of the counting function. Okay, is there any question? Okay. Yes, this is what I wanted to say on the Euclidean space. So let's just say some fun things about this sphere. Well, now we work on the d-dimensional unit sphere, SD, which is then contained in RT plus one. And we are going to denote by sigma the uniform probability measure on SD. And for us, a spherical configuration is just a finite subset of RT plus one, which is congruent to a set on the sphere. And here it's convenient to allow for configurations that are not necessarily on the sphere in order to consider dilations. And we say that the spherical configuration P is admissible if it has at most D points, where D is the dimension of the sphere, and if it's congruent to a collection on the sphere which is linearly independent. So again, we have one cardinality constraint and one non-degeneracy constraint. It's the same as before in the Euclidean space. And then, for several spherical configurations, P1 up to Pn, we define the spherical independence density, MSD, of P1 up to Pn as just the supremum of the measure of A over all measurable sets A, which avoids all of these configurations. And just recall that sigma here for us is normalized. And so this independence density is always between zero and one. Well, the first issue that we encounter on the sphere that we didn't have on the Euclidean space is that the unit sphere is not compatible with dilations in the sense that if we have a configuration which is on the sphere and then we dilate it, it's not necessarily true that this dilated configuration will be congruent to some set on the sphere. But now there is a large class of configurations which I call contractible configurations for which this is true whenever we consider contractions instead of dilations. That is, a, a contractible configuration is just a finite set P on RT plus one, for which T times P is congruent to a set on the sphere for every T between zero and one. And the important example that you should keep in mind is that any set of at most D plus one points on the sphere SD are contractible. And this is just because of a simple geometrical argument. Uh, a set of d plus one points will always be contained in a d-dimensional affine hyperplane. And so if we just take this affine hyperplane and translate it on the direction of its normal vector, then we take similar points on this translated hyperplane intersected with the, with the sphere, then we can get any contraction of the configuration we started with. But 
even though, even then, even for contractual configurations, there is no easy relationship between the independence density of their several different contractions. This parameter is no longer dilation variance, as it was in the Euclidean space. So we need a simple lemma which says that for any fixed contractible configuration P, uh, the independence density of its contractions is bounded away from both zero and one. This is what it means here. So the infimum of the independence density of TP over all T between zero and one is bigger than zero, and the supremum is smaller than one. This is needed in some arguments, but I also think it's, it's a very good lemma to know because it means that the results that we're going to obtain are not trivial, which they could be if it were not bounded away from either zero or one. Oh, and then it's possible to define uh, the counting function of some configuration P in essentially the same way as we did before. It's given by this equation here, which just counts how many congruent hops of P are contained in A. And if you do everything right, then both the counting lemma and the supersaturation theorem will continue to hold on the spherical setting, which were the two main tools in the Euclidean setting and are also the two main tools in the spherical setting. However, the proof of the counting lemma is much more technical. This is mainly due to the fact that we need to use harmonic analysis on the sphere in order to prove the counting lemma, just like we needed Fourier analysis uh, in order to prove the counting lemma in the Euclidean space. But harmonic analysis on the sphere is much more complicated and technical than Fourier analysis on the space. And this makes the proof correspondingly more technical. And also for the supersaturation theorem, we have first to change spaces from the sphere to the orthogonal group, and then afterwards change it again from the orthogonal group to the sphere in order to prove it, or at least in the way that I found to prove it. And this has stumped me for a while. It's not a straight road. And also, we need to relate local notions of independence density and spherical caps to global notions on the sphere. And what I mean by this is the following. So we recall that in the Euclidean space, we had two notions of independence density, one for cubes, which was a local one, and one for the whole RT, which is a global one. And it was very easy to relate these two notions just because we can tile the space using cubes of any side length. However, it's not possible to tile the sphere using spherical caps of any radius. And this makes the uh, getting a relationship between the local and global notions of the independence density much harder than it was in the Euclidean space. However, these difficulties can be overcome. And if you do everything right, then you get essentially the same results as we had in the Euclidean setting. So the first one, uh, is that this is spherical independence density is super multiplicative. So for every uh, configuration P1 up to Pn, their joint independence density is at least equal to the products of their uh, individual independence densities. And this, the proof is actually very similar to what I showed in the Euclidean space, but now considering random rotations of the sets instead of random translations. Now, the second one is when uh, this inequality is almost inequality. It says that if P1 up to Pn are admissible configurations, then the joint independence density of very distant dilates of P1 up to Pn will want to angle and converge the products of the individual independence densities of these dilates. Just note here this. Uh, this thing here is more complicated than we had in the Euclidean space, but only because we can no longer take out the dilation parameters from the independence density because it's not dilation variant. But the result is essentially the same. If we take very far apart dilates of admissible configurations, as long as dilates are between zero and one, uh, so that they can be on the sphere, then they will become independent. And using this result, it's easy to show uh, an analog of Brigand's theorem on the sphere, which uh, recall that Brigand's theorem says that any set of positive upper density on RD 
contains congruent copies of any large enough dilate of admissible configurations. Now we can no longer consider arbitrarily large dilates of a configuration on the sphere because it's bounded, but we can consider arbitrarily small dilates. And this is the corollary that we get. So suppose P is an admissible configuration and let A be a set on the sphere with positive measure. Then there exists some number T0 such that A contains a congruent copy of TP for all T smaller than T0. And finally, just a couple of results, which I mainly find interesting in order to, to compare with results that were already known. So the first one is that the independence density function is continuous on the set of admissible spherical configurations. And the second one is that if P is admissible, then there exists an extra miser P avoiding set A, which attains this extreme of value of density. And here, what's interesting is that both of these results are false for forbidden two-point configurations on the circle S1, which we can think of as the very first instance of a non-admissible configuration. And this was shown by the Quartz and Picurco in 2015. They showed that the function that takes uh, an angle theta to the maximum measure of a set on the circle that does not contain points it's with this angle, from this angle theta, is discontinuous at every rational multiple of 2 pi without the denominator. So the first theorem is not only false, but it's false infinitely often in the case of this non admissible configuration. And they also show that if theta over 2 pi is irrational, then the independence density of theta on the circle is 1 half, but that there is no extremizer theta avoiding set with measure 1 half. So the second theorem is also false in this case. And now just a few open problems so that you can think about it. Well, the first one is, well, do all our theorems hold if the configuration has d plus one points? We recall that the, most of the theorems requires the configuration to be admissible. And the configuration is admissible if, if it has d points, where d is the dimension at most d points, where d is the dimension of the, either the space or the sphere, and if it's non-degenerate. And this non-degeneracy condition was shown to be necessary by Graham, at least in the Euclidean space, because, well, the result simply wouldn't be true if the configuration is not spherical, which is a kind of non-degeneracy condition. However, there exists also a, a usual set of d plus one points on RT will also, with high probability, be, uh, be non-degenerate in the sense, will be a finding dependent. And so, and I believe that the, the theorems also are also true in this case. So, but I want to make it explicit in the conjecture of the first case that I cannot prove. So let's U, P, and W be three non collinear points on the Euclidean plane. And then, if A is a, set of the, a subset of the Euclidean plane that has positive upper density, then there's some number L0 such that A contains a congruent copy of this dilated set, LU of VLW for any L bigger than L0. This I strongly believe to be true, but I haven't been able to prove it. But the second question that I ask is on a suspected compatibility condition. That's, well, since the sphere ST is locally flat and similar to the Euclidean space at small scales, then it seems intuitively or intuitively obvious that the independence density of a very small configuration on the sphere should be very close to the independence density of the same configuration on the space. And this is the question that I pose. If P is contractible, then is it true that the independence density on the sphere of T times P tends to the independence density on the space of P as the parameter T goes to zero? And just note that if P is contractible, then one can show that it's, it's contained on a dimensional affine hyperplane. And so it really is possible to, to just translate it to the space. And finally, one question that's related to the hypergraph removal lemma. And I want to know if the analog of the hypergraph removal lemma 
holds also for configurations on base space for day sphere. Here, um, I'm saying explicitly for day sphere, but you can ask the same question for day space with very minimal differences. So suppose A is a measurable subset of the sphere that contains few copies of some configuration P in the sense that the, the counting function IP of the set A is very small. Then can we erase all copies of P by removing from A a set of small measure? So in other words, if a set A is a measurable set A is close to being P avoiding in the sense that it contains few copies of P, then is it also close to being P avoiding in the sense that it's close to a set that really avoids P? And well, this is everything I had to say. So thank you for your attention. All right. Thanks, Davi. Uh, everyone hit that reaction button. Show him how much we appreciate the talk. Dustin can hit the uh, end.